Welcome to Tip Top, growing up your business with Metronomics. We'll be talking to business thought leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, and business team coaches who have all taken the journey to grow up their businesses to their tip top. We'll be sharing strategies, systems, and stories on how you can grow up your company at the speed you want. If you're searching for your path to the tip top and feel your time is running out, then this podcast is for you. I am your host, Jed Roberts. Today we're talking with Glenn Dahl. Glenn is also a Metronomic Certified Coach, and before that, he was a CEO of several companies. Welcome, Glenn. Thanks, Jed. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, always good to have, always good to talk to you, and great to have you on the show today. So, Glenn, today we're here to talk about your recent white paper, the CEO Playbook, and specifically about the CEO Doom Loop. But before we dive into that, maybe you can give us some of your background. What what led you to becoming a Metronomics Coach? Yeah, great question, Jed. I um, so I, I'm I always tell people I grew up outside of Detroit, and when I graduated high school, I found myself working on an assembly line at, at an auto plant through happenstance and luck and perseverance and luck, more luck. Uh, I actually uh, wound up at a point in my career where I found myself uh, being the CEO of a publicly traded company, which is a pretty big, pretty big leap for me, and having the opportunity to to really run a company and learn what that's all about. Um, our company was, it was a publicly traded company. Actually, we ended up getting basically taken over, um, which was a, an experience for me of, of learning the ins and outs of how that kind of business strategy and maneuvering can work. And, uh, and following that was when I was then looking, trying to decide what did I want to do? Um, I still, this, the skill set to become a CEO and I, I knew I was, or to be a CEO, I knew I was confident in that, but at the same point in time, I didn't know if I really wanted to take that on again. Uh, it was almost like I'd been there, I'd done that. I learned a lot of lessons, though, and I still love business. I, I loved helping people. I would always talk to my people about their business. And um, I was going to actually become uh, a business consultant and, or, or management consultant. I remember being, I got recruited by this management consulting firm. This seemed like a great thing for me to do. And I sat down with the CEO of that company, and uh, I've been through their whole recruiting process, and this was almost time to get the interview. And I still remember his, he talked to me for two hours. He said, Glenn, I'm not going to hire you. And I was like, what, wait, what? <laughs> and, and he said, he goes, you know, Glenn, he goes, I'd hire you. You do great, but you wouldn't be here very long. You'd be here for a year or two. He goes, Glenn, you're a CEO. He goes, I know what that's like. I'm a CEO. He goes, you don't want to work for me. You don't want to work for anybody. He goes, here's what, here's what I think you should do, Glenn. Glenn, I think you should become a scaling up coach. I have a scaling up coach. I would pay you to be my coach, but I already have one. He goes, but I think you'd be an amazing coach. Like I, I can tell you know what you're doing and, and you know, I think you've got great people skills. I think you should do that. And I ended up getting introduced to his scaling up coach and I went to become a, a scaling up coach. Very first day I was there, I met Shannon Susco. And well, so there you go. S same story for me. Yeah, is that yeah? So, so that really led you know learning scaling up and then and learning the basics of that system and helping companies and then really learning um, the three hag way and in and, and then with Shannon is what then led me to want to become a metronomics coach, which I think you and I both kind of share the feeling. I think that's that's a, a definitely a level up, uh, but a natural progression to being able to do what we do. Uh, absolutely, and and a very very similar theme comes out when I interview uh, the metronomics coaches. You know the all been CEOs, all run businesses, reached a point in our lives where we just don't don't have the, you know, the 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 power to do it again, don't have the passion to do it again, but we want to take what we've learned with running these businesses and then show other CEOs how they can avoid those issues and learn from those lessons. And if we can do it to a, to twelve CEOs at one time, well, all the better. You know, we're making an impact. It's a it's a huge difference to just changing the trajectory of a single business to changing the trajectory of a, a dozen businesses or 10, 10 businesses. Yeah. And I, I, I share now, I, I was timid to share this earlier uh, before my coaching career, but now I'm really, my core purpose, why I do what I do is so that no CEO has to be as lonely or as frustrated as I was. Um, because I really was, it was a very lonely place. And I remember many nights I waking up at three in the morning and just not knowing what to do, but always feeling like I had to know what to do because I was I thought I was supposed to be the smartest person in the room. Yep, similar theme, similar theme. Yeah. So 
So you've recently published a, a white paper. Yes. Tell us about how that came about. Yeah. So the CEO playbook, uh, really interesting. It was it was in combination with a couple of, of our uh, Metronomics coaches, and we were working uh, through a, a marketing program that we had enrolled in. And one of the recommendations in this marketing program was find out what are the pain points of your clients. He said, how do you do that? Ask them. So they had this format uh, of an interview. It was just called the Ask Interview. It was, it was all about uh, talking to our potential clients and finding out what are their pain points, what are the issues that they they really uh, stumble with, and so that we could figure out how do we then position our services to help them the best. And and really following the interview format was really enlightening, and we learned a lot. And after we had done some of them, we came up with the idea. We were comparing notes and said, well, why don't we – why don't we keep doing this and publish these results? Because we're getting some amazing insights and some really great information out of this that um, that I think would be valuable. And then even when we came a time that we had the 72 interviews, we hired an analyst and it was really that analyst and looking at the data, not just, you know, the, the, the qualitative, the quantitative, qualitative, I guess, of the, you know, what the CEOs were telling us. But when we looked at their responses and categorized them, and started seeing the correlations, that's when this the, the CEO doom loop really emerged. And to me, it was it, it was kind of one of those aha moments. To like, wow, we we really we have to put some effort behind sharing this. Reading through the the white paper, you know, one of the things that struck me, well, firstly, is nearly all of those things come back to people. They come back to to team. And the the other thing was that that there's there aren't really any surprises in business. Every CEO, every leadership team is facing exactly the same problem. Now, yeah. there might be different different um, degrees, uh, but mm-hmm. the problems that are coming up day to day, they're always, pretty much always the same. There's a great similarity in in the issues and they're, they're around, well, and to your point, so many of them are the people, like CEOs will come out and be like, I don't have the right team. Or um, I, I don't, my people don't, you know, have lack of accountability. They don't do what they say they are. And even interestingly enough, when, or there's a lack of growth, we're not growing. And as you probably do as well, when I start asking those questions underneath, like what, why, it usually does come down to the, the, the people issues. Well, yeah, we, we've, you know, we've been through three head of sales and no, you know, no one ever gets the job done. And I, what I really started seeing in the interviews I was doing and reading through the comments of the others was that CEOs are very quick to point out the issues, like, you know, anywhere but at themselves. And it was very few of the CEOs that really were, you know, uh, had enough of that, that self-examination to be able to say, like, it's me. But I think ultimately, is you know, as we find, when you really start peeling the onion back, you really do see that. Um, any issue in a company, the CEO is either causing it or they're tolerating it. Yeah. And you get what you tolerate. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100%. There's a, there's a great Jim Collins, Jim Collins phrase. Are you looking through the window or are you looking in the mirror? You know, are you looking through the window to find someone else to point the finger at, or are you looking at the mirror because it's probably you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I like that a lot. It, I actually just mm-hmm. used that uh, with the CEO and the team this week. Mm-hmm. And, and something I take from that is I'd say, well, really great leaders, when something goes well, that's when they look out the window. Like, right? Who can I who can I include in here? You know, the team, who did really well. Um, but if something goes wrong, they need to look in the mirror to say, okay, I accept mm-hmm. the blame for this. Because ultimately, yep. as the CEO, right, the, the buck stops here. Yep, yep. There's a there's a really good quote um, in in your white paper, and I'm not going to quote it um, uh, perfectly, uh, but it's it's really about at some stage every CEO needs to realize that no matter what industry they're in, they're in the people business. Yes. T- talk talk about that. I mean, how did that finding come out? Yeah, um, it was really interesting because there were a fair amount of CEOs that talked about um, really what they didn't like about their job or what they struggled with the most were the people. And, and some of them, frankly, like say, yeah, that, why I don't like my job is I have to deal with people. And I, I wish I didn't have to deal with people so much. And, you know, because you think of the, the other, you know, was that Marshall Goldsmith that said, what got you here won't get you there, right? 
And for many of the owner entrepreneur types that we work with, really what got them here was their sheer perseverance, maybe their knowledge or expertise in, in the market of what they did. But to scale a business, they need they really need to leave a lot of that behind and they need to rely uh, on others. And um, if they can't learn to do that, if they still rely on that technical competency, um, their business is going to stall and potentially fail. It, it won't grow. And, and I, I saw that in some of these CEOs as they were talking about their struggles is because they didn't embrace what we would call, Judd, is the soft side, right? You know, metro, in metro numbers, you talk about the three hag ties together, the hard edge and the soft edge of the business. And, and I think so many CEOs and leaders gain comfort in the, in the mechanical side of things, the hard side, the numbers. But if you can't equally have the right people and be able to tie those two together, it won't happen. And, and that's one of the biggest realizations I, I see with uh, the CEOs and the leadership teams I work with is you know, that final recognition that the hard systems are easy and the soft systems are hard. So it's just human nature to gravitate towards the hard systems because they're, we, it's mechanistic. You know how to fix them. We know how to formulate strategy. We know how to execute. We know how to manage cash and make sure we've got enough oxygen to, to, to fund, invest back into the business. It's the soft stuff that's hard. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. What, uh, Jed, what, what other, did you, going through the white paper, if you don't mind me turning the tables on you, I'd be really curious since, since we're both coaches is, um, was there, was there anything that kind of particularly stuck out at you that you saw, you saw in the CEOs you coach? I think there were, there were many points there that, that resonated. One of the things that surprised me, which I hadn't seen was that the, you know, the, the, the finding you had that many CEOs are fed up with dealing with people problems. You know, it's uh, to, to the point where, and you know, the evidence or the, the data in the white paper seems to suggest that they're so fed up that they've pretty much given up trying to deal with it. And if you, if you give up dealing with people problems, then, well, now you, you're, you're on a fast path down, aren't you? You're on a fast path down. Yes. Yeah. I think that's right. Right. They're, 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 you shut mm -hmm. down. And, and I think that is one of the characteristics that can put a CEO into the doom loop is that, that, that shutting down and non-reliance on their leadership team or uh, their non-involvement with their leadership team. Because if they're alienating that leadership team, the, the leadership team's going to check out. I've been working with a CEO up until quite recently and his, his approach to, and they're growing really, really fast, but they're growing mm -hmm. really fast through pure aggression. And um, his, his approach to hiring on his leadership team is, I want to hire people that are going to get me through at least nine to 12 months. No. And after that, they're probably not going to be good enough. And it's, but you know, he's creating this reputation in the marketplace about a CEO who burns leaders. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 I'm saying to him, like, you know, over time, you're going to find it harder and harder to recruit really high caliber, A-class executives because you would have created a reputation that um, people don't last you. Yeah, for whatever mm -hmm. reason, people don't last. Yeah. Uh, and his view is, I just need him, need him to get me to the next level. Then I'll get someone else. We're, we're not working together anymore. Good, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, Non-coachable category, right? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, the, the other thing I picked up, and, and this is uh, something I've, um, I've sort of you know, thought about a lot before you, you, you quote uh, Patrick Lencioni's books, you know, the, you know, the four obsessions of an extraordinary CEO. Uh, and I love, I love that book. I mean, it's one of the first uh, of his books I, I read. Uh, but when I read it first, I thought, well, there's only three obsessions here. And then reading through it again, you realize that, you know, the, t the two in the middle, you know, creates organizational clarity and over communicate organizational clarity. And I thought, well, why didn't he just call it creates and over communicate organizational clarity? And after a while, I realized that they are fundamentally different things. Creating organizational clarity is one set of skills. You know, it's about strategy formulation. It's about an articulating, it's about defining a clear and simple and communicatable strategy, but the actual communication and the over communication is something that is completely, completely different. And if he, if he had loved them together, well, first of all, it would have probably been a shorter book, but secondly, you know, it would have confused the issue of creation with over communication. Yeah. That's a really great insight, Chad. You're exactly right. I, um, yeah, I was, 
and having the talk actually with the CEO working with, um, because I'll have one thing I do know, and I, I remember this as a CEO, all right, here's our strategy. And I remember spending time with our marketing communications person to craft this PowerPoint deck, did the town hall in front of the whole company. And I just, oh man, I thought I nailed it. Like great message and I had good feedback. And I thought I was done. I just communicated. Everybody knows where we're going. They know how we're going to get there. They know why we're going there. And, and I was I was really that naive to not understand that. It, and every time someone would ask me, well, where are we going? Like, I, I, I you know, did then the company meeting last February. Why weren't you there? Weren't you listening? And I so all right, let me tell you again. Let me tell you again. And I got really tired of hearing myself talk. But now I really realize that that's what CEO, you, we have to do that. And uh, one of my CEOs asked me, I said, well, when, when will I know that I've done my job? And I said, when you start hearing it back, it echoes back at you and it's right. I mean, there's, there is the, the, that great quote. I don't, I don't know who actually said this, but they, you know, it takes between five to eight times for someone to hear something before it starts to get through. Yeah. Yeah. Heard that. And I take that one step further in the, in the, and I, I'm, I'm a former maths geek. I love recursion. So one of the things I say to the CEOs I work with is, you know, how many times do you think you're going to have to be told that it takes five to eight times <laughs> to hear something before you accept that it takes five to eight times to accept oh. something? And I suddenly realize, actually, yeah, you've only told me three times. I haven't really got that yet. I haven't got it yet. So if I haven't got it as a CEO, I'm not over communicating. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's good. To, can I steal that from you, John? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. This is what all, this is all about. It's about sharing, isn't it? There's, yeah. And I, I don't, I don't often quote George Bernard Shaw in in um, in a metronomics podcast, uh, but he's got a quote that I absolutely love that I use a lot with my clients. So you know, the the problem with communication is the illusion it's happened. Oh yes, yeah, yep. That's good. I didn't. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really good. You know, I, I told someone once. Why don't they get it? Yeah. Yeah. I wish I knew yeah. that. I wish I knew that when I, I know now. Anyway, Glenn, we've been talking around the, the doom loop. Why don't you yep. take us through the doom loop? Yeah. Um, the doom loop is, um, as you can see here, it looks complicated. And, and I think there's a lot that feeds into it. But ultimately, it's it's around those the, the kind of those two top bubbles up there around, which is around the, the CEO's confidence, um, you know, and the, their, their fears and the confidence where they and some of the CEOs shared, like they just didn't, they, they don't have confidence in themselves as, as CEOs. And one of the, I actually heard the exact same quote from at least two of the CEOs, if not three, which was, um, I'm a, you know, I'm like, what's your biggest fear? I'm afraid the whole thing is just going to go to shit. And I heard it. I'm going to drive into, into a ditch. I'm going to ruin the business my father built. You know, a lot of it, CEOs have this imposter syndrome of this innate fear. Um, and I think there's also the, the idea then is that, okay, so if a CEO has this, this hidden lack of confidence in themselves as a CEO or in, in their skills, and um, they feel they don't know really what they should be doing as a CEO, um, which then many people go back to what got them there, which was, oh, I was a great salesperson. I was great at operations. I was, you know, I was the CFO. I'm really great at finance. They start kind of diving back into the business at that at those levels, which then really alienates their leadership team. Because if they're trying to build a great leadership team, um, and right, and by by basically knocking those people out of the way, um, those people start getting alienated, potentially leave or kind of check out of their jobs, um, which then results in that lack of business results. Because no CEO of a scaled company can do everything. And also, by the way, if they're diving back down and doing those other jobs, they're not doing their role as, C as CEO, which is, as we talked about, one of the things is, right, setting the clarity of vision, culture, and communicating it. Those are like kind of abstract notions for someone who worked their way up in the company out of having a technical competency. So then, as you can see, if we're having a lack of business results, what, happen what does the CEO do? Do they get more confident? No, they get less confident. And they start getting scared. They start getting nervous. So they start trying to do more in, in the company versus doing what's counterintuitive to them, where they should spend more time leading, setting the vision, communicating it, and then encouraging their senior leadership team to help power that vision. 
that they're doing just the opposite is they're, they're abandoning their vision and getting back into the business. And that's the doom loop. Yep. 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 So that, that initial fear of failure, I mean, that, that drives straight back down to the primitive brain, doesn't it? Now that sort of, now that initiates that, you know, flight, fight or flight response, you know, and you never come, you're never in a good position when that's being triggered. You know, so that, that, that then impacts the confidence levels, you know, and then they start doubting their team, as you explained. And then, you know, most CEOs, as you say, they're practitioners, they want to roll their sleeves up. You know, the strength of the CEO is often the weakness of the company. No, because there is now going, they're, they're now going to retreat back into what they know and get operational, get tactical and start making decisions that are maybe not fully thought, thought, thought through. And yeah, it just cycles through. Yep. Yeah. I, I literally, I saw, I worked with a company for a couple of years and the CEO, uh, had a, had a helicopter, they had a helicopter. Okay. And it was a, it was a pretty large construction company. And I heard a story about where he had helicoptered into a job site and walked around the job site and saw someone, one of, one of the frontline workers engaged in the activity with one of the construction tools. He literally went up and said, hey, you're not doing that right. Step aside, I'm going to show you. And he like took the tool and started doing this job. And you just, on that, so many levels, that's just a, that's a horrible example of, you know, a CEO going from literally flying in to push someone out of the way to say, you know, you can't do your job well. I'm going to show you how to do this job. And, and what kind of example does that set? Maybe we should coin a new term, you know, helicopter CEOing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've used that actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so where did at some point did he realize that what he was doing was having a negative impact on the business? Um, yes. Although, even though at, at an intellectual level, I'd say yes. But on an intuitive level, he couldn't let go of it, and I think I think that might come to that that example of a of an uncoachable, you know, where someone can can maybe recognize it and talk to it, but just innately, especially when under pressure. To your right, that that fight or flight, you know, we just retreat into our learned patterns, and and we're in the doom loop. And I would say that was definitely someone a CEO in the doom loop. There is no doubt about it uh, because we experience, they experience really high level growth and then crashed. And that's a, that's a symptom I've seen with high level growth companies. They're, they're really, oh, this is great. We're experiencing these levels of growth, but ultimately they, they basically are way over the tips of their skis in that growth. And then they crash and, and the crash puts them into more fear. And then they just panic and, and make some bad moves. Hopefully most CEOs, right? Um, I think, you know, I've seen this with some clients like, okay, we're there to help them or they, they, they learn, they see enough to say, okay, what do I need to do differently? How can I work my way proactively out of this versus being caught in that spiral? So as a, as a coach, what are, what are the signs you look for uh, when you're trying to assess whether the CEO is in or about to enter that CEO doom loop. There must be, there must be indicators that you can sort of think, ah, there's one and uh, there's one. Uh, what, what do you look for? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it's a great question. So sometimes early into uh, an engagement with a company where I'm, we're doing the first couple of rounds of the functional accountability chart, uh, if the CEO's name is in too many of the boxes for the functional accountability, um, Another good, another way to tell is in, in our one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions where, you know, in, in our session, I'll observe the head of sales maybe isn't, you know, they're not performing, um, they're not hitting their metrics, or there's even, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of trust from either the CEO or other members of the team of, of one of the team, senior leadership team members, and then and having the talk with the, the CEO of like, well, yeah, they don't do... You know, I can't get them to do what they say they're going to do. I can't, they're, they're never accountable. And that's then we have to come back to say, well, okay, as CEO, what are you doing about that? Are you in so many times that I'll find the CEO is, well, I've been doing this or I'm going on all the large sales calls because I don't trust that leader versus doing the right thing of, no, you, you need to let that person go. You need to make clear their expectations, hold them accountable to those expectations. And then if they're not, they can't or are not achieving them, you need to find the right person. 
um, doing their job for them is not the way to go or ignoring them or belittling them in a leadership meeting is not the way to, to lead because you're just setting a poor example for the rest of the leadership team, right? Um, especially for CEOs, is if they're not, if they're not, if they're saying accountability is, is important, which it it should be, but they're not holding uh, one or more members of the leadership team, uh, they're not holding them accountable. Then no one else will will allow themselves to be held accountable. So I think it's that seeing that kind of double standard, right? And as we mentioned earlier on, you know, you get what you tolerate. Yeah, yeah. What, do you have any examples? That, have you seen that show up yourself of how you might identify a CEO in that doom loop? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I guess I, I didn't write the, the, the white paper, so I'm sort of, you know, I'm learning, learning the, the process. But um, I think I, I, <laughs> I, I certainly can, I can empathize and I can see the parallels between that fear of failure. And, like, you know, now, we, we all have that fear of failure. Well, most of us do. Some of us don't have that level of self-awareness, but uh, you know, you know, that fear of failure, it's, it's about what you do with it. You know, does it galvanize you into action you know, uh, positively, or does it make you feel even less confident and does it sort of you know, send you into that spiral, spiral down? Now, and I, and I, personally, I've always struggled with fear of failure. I've always struggled with, you know, imposter syndrome and not thinking I'm good enough. And, uh, you know, so that's very, very real for me. Um, I think where, where I see that with CEOs is, and I think you alluded to this earlier on, is like, you know, where they've gone through a period of growth and then things start plateauing. And you know, they, they've, they've done two, three, maybe four quarters of, of growth, but then for some reason, something changes. You know, and that could be an external market condition. You know, it could be one of the leadership team. They've, they've done two, three, maybe four quarters of, of growth. But then for some reason, something changes, you know, and that could be an external, uh, and they've loved the feeling of growth so much that they are loath to set it, to see it go, you know, so they start making, you know, knee jerk reaction decisions. They start making the wrong decisions. They keep, they vacillate. Um, I've got, um, I've got a couple of CEOs who, are, um, you're a disc practitioner as well, you know, uh, who are high D and high C, you know, so they make decisions really, really quickly, but then they second guess themselves uh, and, um, come back and sort of you know, constantly chop and change around their decision-making. And you can see that when something's going wrong and they're trying to get in there and fix it. And when you're in that situation, you know, the, the decisions you're making are almost invariably wrong because you're not you're not giving it the time, you're not giving it the, the thought process that it really needs. And you're probably not listening to the support and advice of your leadership team and also probably the coach. Now, so they're making decisions. Now they're, they're probably not the right ones and it just makes it worse. You know, it just continues that, that loop through. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Judd. And I, I think it ties back to something we've already talked about, but the, the CEOs who don't want to deal with the people issues. Right. Or they, gee, if I didn't, and, and, I, and I do, I've seen many, it's like, they, they really wanted like, well, I just want to hire great people and trust them to do their jobs, which in a CEO's mind means stepping away um, versus always being there, always being proactive as a coaching. It's not a micromanaging, but it's always coaching um, the, your, your people in your team, but it's also involving them when there are tough decisions to be made is like tapping into that collective intelligence of, of the smart people, listening to them. And then making the right decisions based on, upon their input versus exactly as you said, like, well, I can't trust them. I don't have the right people. So therefore, I'm going to make my own decisions in a vacuum. And many times uh, their bad decisions are not well thought through. Of the insights that you pulled out you know, with the, the analyst and the data, you know, which one do you think is the one that is the most significant out of out of the white paper, out of the study? Yeah, great question, Chad. I, I go back to it's the doom loop, the, the the, the doom loop itself and the that CEO mindset of of the, the lack of confidence and not taking proactive steps positive proactive steps and it's it, it is I can see where it's counterintuitive um, I don't know if you're a you know if like you're a snow skier this is one of the things I learned early yeah we, we don't get much snow here in Australia yeah that's all right um, but in snow skiing, it, it's really interesting. So if, if one gets on a steep slope, the intuitive thought is to lean back 
And when one leans back on a steep slope, you lose control of your skis. You should actually lean in down the hill of which initially you'll gather, start getting more speed, but actually it's the speed that allows you the control. So you can turn, execute turns, avoid, and that gives you the control. You can control your speed and your direction versus if you one leans back, you actually lose control. And so what I, in, in seeing in the doom loop and how the, the data played out and the insights was that the CEOs who didn't lean into the issues and involve others and, and seek to do the counterintuitive thing. So intuitively, they're going to dive back down into what they have always done, right? They're, I'm going to go fix this myself versus counterintuitive, like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to rise to leading even more. I'm going to talk about our vision. I'm going to, right, I'm going to coach my leaders, I'm going to empower them more. I'm going to involve them more. Um, that is to me the, the biggest one. And I, I get that because I suffered from that as a CEO myself. I always felt that I had to be the smartest person in the room. I felt that I had to have the answers. And, and that was just a very naive way of thinking that, that got me only so far as a CEO. It would have been a much easier ride. I think it's interesting, you know, around the world, we use different analogies and, uh, you know, in, in your part of the world, you use skiing analogies and, you know, they don't really land here because, you know, we, we don't have much snow here. Fair enough. <laughs> so, you know, you know, leaning forward on skis and, uh, you know, that's uh, like, you know, yeah, okay. Yeah. I think I know way. what he means. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's doing, it's doing yeah. the counter, counter, it's making the counterintuitive move. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. know, you know, martial arts. I know, I know something like that with, you know, if someone's coming forward to strike us, our is like to stiffen up and we're versus many martial arts is no, as you relax yeah. and you bring it and control it because when you right mm -hmm. versus the, um, if you put yourself into a, into a solid position, you actually don't have control, but if you go with the movement, yeah. you can guide and direct it. Yeah. 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 That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So, so a CEO, reads your white boy, he downloads your white paper, he reads mm -hmm. a white paper, uh, and they say to themselves, hmm, that's me. What should they do? Well, Jed, you and I are first going to say, yeah, they should get a coach. But what I would say that they should do is I think they should really take a lot of self-reflection, you know, a good hard look at themselves and say, am I really the best person to be a CEO? Do I want to be a great CEO? And if so, what do I need to do to be a great CEO? And, and I think having armed with that, if they, if, if they, it's their, they decide that that's what they want to do and they want to be the best CEO they can, I mean, there's a variety of resources. And I would say, yeah, obviously working a coach with a coach is a, a really good one. Um, I love the works of Pat Lencioni, um, you know, and there, there's the whole school of thought about like, why does one want to be a CEO? Is it for the, for the intrinsic or the extra extrinsic rewards, you know, the self-reflection there, but certainly, um, CEO is not, it's not an easy job and it is, it's a different skill set for many of us from what got us there and to be able to um, approach it such a way to think, I can't just keep doing what I've always been doing. It's then what do I need to do to learn those skill sets around the vision and culture and the communication around that and, and, and having great coaching conversations, hiring great people. There's so many things that are are kind of hands off, and, and for many people that are used to getting that rolling up their sleeves, right, and diving into the work, um, are uncomfortable and counterintuitive. So, first and foremost, would be that self reflection and decide to 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 make that change, and to and to call you or I, <laughs> you or me. get a coach, get a coach. <laughs> You, you, you referenced um, a Patrick Lencioni book there. I can't actually remember the title of that book. It's one of his more recent ones. It's probably his, his last yeah, two, and two books ago. Yeah, um, the motive. Yeah, we'll, 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 the motive. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. We'll, yes. we'll, we'll put a li we'll put a link to that in the in the show notes. Here. Great idea. Okay, um, and I guess the last question I had is, how would someone who is interested in this white paper get a copy? Oh, great question, John. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's available on our on our website as a free downloadable resource. So um, you can reach out on apexnorthcoaching.com here in the US um, or reach me, message me, uh, and download their own copy. Okay, so we'll um, we'll make sure we get um, those links and uh, that de those details in 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 the show notes. Um, and before we move to wrapping up. Um, want to come back to snow for a moment. 
Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm actually in Indonesia at the moment and it is very, very hot. There's certainly no snow here. Uh, a few days ago, uh, back home in Australia, it was 41 degrees cent centigrade. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it is very, very hot. Uh, but in just over four, what, about six weeks time, we'll be in Vancouver, in Whistler. Uh, and that is probably, and I'm expecting to see snow there. And that will probably be the first time I've seen snow in about oh, 17, 18 years. Well, fantastic. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, now I, I hate the cold, so it's a bit of a double-edged sword, um, but I am excited about seeing real snow, proper snow, because it's been a long, yeah. long, long time. Well, maybe you and I can take a break from the Metronomics Tip Top Summit. Yeah. Well, I would probably need to do Skiing 101 before we did that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. That, that's been such a, such a good conversation and really, really uh, glad to be able to get the CEO doom loop and particularly, you know, the CEO playbook um, out there uh, to, to people who are listening and, and watching. Uh, thanks. Awesome. That's a great conversation. Thanks so much for, uh, for, 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 for talking with me today. Uh, any final points from yourself, Ben? Yeah, you know, Jed, I, I think um, the point of, I can't, I can't overstate it really. And, and while it is self-serving for us, but for, for, CEOs to think about um, for those to become great at their game, just like a, a sports you know, figure. I wish I had had a coach as a CEO. I really do. And I talked about my purpose of, of this. It was a frustrating and lonely job. And I know I could have been a better person for myself, for my family, for my employees, my shareholders and, and, and our customers. Um, and I think ultimately for anybody who is a CEO and is interested in becoming better, I, I would suggest they look at um, you know, pot potentially engaging a professional to help them on that journey. Thanks so much. It's been, I always enjoy um, our chats, I always enjoy um, you know, uh, having those, those deep um, philosophical, but also fun conversations. So great to have you on the show and um, we will speak soon and I will see you in just a few weeks in Whistler, Vancouver, Canada. Yes. I appreciate the opportunity, Jed. This is great. Good conversation. Thanks so much. Tip Top is brought to you by Metronomics. To find out more about Metronomics and how this 20 plus year old proven system will save you time and money as you grow up your business, visit metronomics.com. That is M-E-T-R-O-N-O-M-I-C-S dot com. Also search for Metronomics in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else the great podcasts are found.